Gary Prager, was educated in the United Kingdom. He already had a lifelong passion for the study of English, English history, and he spent many years on researching and studying the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, and has given several presentations on that topic. Gary has presented classes at Rollins College Lifelong Institute of Learning on different topics dealing with the life of Sir Winston Churchill, the House of Windsor, the English Civil War, the House of Stuart, and also the fall of the British Empire, 1946-1966. His lecture today is titled The Origins of the Israeli-Arab Conflict. Now, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the uh, Gary's presentation. So, save your questions to, uh, at that moment. Okay. So, basically, uh, on behalf of the History Group of the University Club of Winter Park, it's been a great pleasure to present you Gary Craig. Gary? My name is Gary Prager, and what I'm going to be doing today is, is hopefully to give you a broad view, because this is a topic that could take weeks to present in, in its entirety, but to give you a broad view of the origins behind the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, when we think of the Arab-Israeli conflict, we think, of course, of the wars. The wars that first began in 1948, the 1956 war, or, or as it was known as the Suez Campaign, the Suez War, the 1967 war, the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, the Lebanon War, all of these wars that have been going on, including the Intifada, by, by the way, the Arab uprising against uh, the, what they can perceive to be the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and other Palestinian territories, um, has been, uh, for the most part, at the forefront. But if you talk about in, uh, in historical terms, the conflict itself goes back a lot further than 1948. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing today is to give you an overview. And I'm hoping that in the hour that I have to present this to you, I'm going to be able to give you as much information as possible, but also first-hand contemporary quotes and sources from the time of the events that I'm going to outline. So a lot of this is not my opinion. It's actually also people speaking, so to speak, from the grave people that you may not know about, who are in the deep recesses of the historical past, will be able, of course, to come alive in a way, after a fashion, and give their point of view to you today here in the audience. So if we can, can we start with the first slide, please? You see there a picture of the last British High Commissioner to Palestine, uh, Sir Alan Cunningham. General Sir Alan Cunningham, the British High Commissioner for Palestine and Transjordan. Why is he important to the origins of the Arab-Israeli conflict, seeing that he was the last commissioner? Well, in order to understand how everything went wrong, so to speak, let's begin with the end date for the purpose of our lecture, which of course will be the departure from Palestine by Great Britain in uh, in uh, 1948, I'm not very good with dates, so I have to double check my facts here. So, on uh, May the 18th, 1948, at 8 a.m. sharp, General Sir Alan Cunningham left the British High Commissioner's residence in Jerusalem from a place called the Hill of Evil Intent, which, by the way, historically was supposed to have been the site of the residence of the high priest of Jerusalem, Caiaphas, of course, is mentioned in the New Testament. That's where the residence was. That hill is still there, by the way. Um, and uh, so he left. He left in a Daimler limousine car that was sent to him by the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Sir Clement Attlee, who put the car on the transport plane. The plane was sent to Cyprus, and then it went on a boat, and it arrived in Palestine. So he really left in style. So he left, and um, the night before he left, he made a radio address for the benefit, for the most part, of the British troops that remained in Palestine, in 
1948, before the war actually broke out with the Arabs. And he said this, I'm quoting him here, I have never believed and do not believe now that the seed of agreement between Jew and Arab does not exist, even though in all of our efforts we have failed to find the soil in which it would germinate. That was the essence of his last radio address. He took one look around the beautiful manicured gardens of his residential villa, got into the uh, car that had been given to him by Atlee. The car took off. It went to uh, the port of Haifa. And there in Haifa, waiting for him, okay, was the British light cruiser, HMS Euralysis. And HMS Euralysis picked him up and he left Palestine. The flags were lowered, the British flag. This was the, one of the early beginnings, by the way, of the flags going down on the British Empire. And the end of the mandate of Palestine happened at that moment. And of course, almost immediately, within days, Jews and Arabs in Israel were at each other's throats. And that's where we really have the culmination of many, many years of disagreement, of broken promises, of promises made that were unrealistic from the beginning, and it is this that we're going to discuss in today's presentation. So that's how we come in here. So, um, let if we can, can we go to the uh, picture, the next slide, of Captain Alfred Dreyfus. Now, before I actually talk about Dreyfus, I want to mention to you a phenomenon that happened at the end of the 19th century. Now today, here in America, we think of ourselves as being part of a great union, the United States of America. That's the nation that we belong to. And likewise, in other European countries, or around the world for that matter, we have different nation states. But this was a relatively new concept right up until the middle of the 19th century. And so what happened in the 19th century for the first time mainly in European countries, not in countries like Great Britain, which had been a state going back to the, uh, you know, to the time of William the Conqueror, almost, in the 11th century. But what was happening in European countries is that old empires and old city-states, principalities, were beginning to unravel. And what you were having was a growth in nationalism, the idea of national identity. And there was one key incident that took place towards the end of the 19th century that really set in motion a catalyst that started to spin that could not be controlled, where other countries were trying to, you know, uh, enforce their own sense of national identity. And this country where this happened was in Italy. And in Italy you had what was known as a risorgimento, where all the principal states of Italy, the old medieval city-states, okay, started to come together under the concept of a national identity, the identity of Italy. And this was led, of course, by a man called uh, Garibaldi. And Garibaldi, along with his colleague, Count Cavour, in Italy, was able, over a fairly long period of time, to galvanize all the Italian uh, small city-states into one entity and eventually gain their independence from the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Of course, you had the Papal States. That was a bit later, but that happened states that were controlled by the Catholic Church, but there were not many of those. So Italy becomes independent. And what this does is, is that it ferments a, a huge spread of, uh, of statehood around Europe, this idea of creating states. And it was also part of, by the way, the Enlightenment of Europe at that time. The idea that it really didn't matter who you were as an individual, if you identified with a particular state, so in other words, let's say if you were in Germany, and you identified yourself as a German, that was enough. It was not important to uh, consider yourself, uh, your religion was, was not as important as it had been in the past. Now, there was a very young man, and this is where I'm going to get onto our topic and how it relates to Captain Alfred Dreyfus. There was a young uh, newsman, a newspaper reporter, by the name of Theodore Herzl. Now, Theodore Herzl was working at the time for a Viennese newspaper, okay, and this paper sent him, it was called the Neue Free Press, or the New Free Press, this newspaper sent him to France to cover a trial that was taking place concerning this man, Captain Alfred Dreyfus. 
Now, Alfred Dreyfus worked at the time for the French Security Office. This would be the equivalent in today's terms for the State Department. And so his job was to collect information about anything concerning French national security. And he reached the rank of captain, which was a very high rank, and in particular, when one considers that he was Jewish. So he was actually the, probably the highest ranking Jewish officer, you could say, in the, in the equivalent of the French secret service. However, what happened was, of course, was that he was accused, okay, of taking secrets, French secrets, and giving them over to the Germans. And the French had recently fought a war, the Franco-Prussian War, Germany, Prussia being the biggest part of Germany at that time. And Dreyfus was arrested, he was charged with espionage, and following a very quick trial in Paris, Dreyfus was sentenced to life imprisonment on the French island of Martinique, or as it was known as, generally speaking, Devil's Island. And Devil's Island was a place, of course, where nobody could escape from. It was the French equivalent, you could say, of Alcatraz. I mean, I think they said that one person escaped from Alcatraz, but they never found his body. He was never located, probably drowned or whatever. But, but, but Dreyfus was shunted off, along with all the other criminals that the French wanted to get rid of, and marooned on the island. Now, Dre now Herzl, as the uh, editor, not that I had, had told him, was to cover this trial. He was absolutely shocked, not only by the speed at which the trial took place, it was all over in a couple of days, but also the vitriol that there had appeared in the French press. And most of this vitriol actually centered around the fact of Dreyfus's Jewishness, rather than who he was or what he had been accused of doing. And so what happened is that this, you could say this press, uh, the, the, you know, the newspaper coverage, along with the speediness of the trial, really gave Captain Dreyfus not much chance of adequately, you know, producing a, a serious defence. And so what happened uh, to Herzl at this meeting? Can we go to Herzl now? Oh, no, actually, let's go to the next, the next slide, which I think is at the break. <coughs> and so, prior to him being sent to uh, Devil's Island, Dreyfus was stripped of his military rank. Now, stripping was a very serious, uh, serious punishment. What this involved was, uh, at the time, I think it actually happened here in the States and other countries until fairly recently, the officer or the, the soldier in question would be taken into a square surrounded by his regiment or the troops, and there, every item of his military clothing would be torn off and thrown to the ground. So his epaulets would have been stripped, his hat would have been taken off and thrown to the ground. You can see it in that picture. And the final act of demasculation, you could call it, was the breaking of his sword. That symbolized the end of his military career. It took place at a place in Paris called Les Invalides. Les Invalides, and you can see that big dome in the background there. That's actually the central dome at Les Invalides, which was the headquarters of the French army, still is, uh, is where Napoleon the first, you know, the Napoleon Bonaparte was buried. So this mausoleum in the background, as you can see there, is the backdrop for the humiliation of Dreyfus. Herzl gave a lot of thought to what had happened. He was very, very uh, concerned, he was upset, and he had an aha moment, you could say a realization, okay, that the only solution to the problem of the Jewish people in Europe was to create a new solution to the Jewish problem. Now, of course, the term Jewish solution has very bad connotations. We think of the Nazis, but this had been a question, the Jewish question, the Judenfrage, as, as Herzl called it, had been a question which had been, uh, in a way, occupying the minds of intellectuals and political scientists around the world for centuries. Who are the Jews? Are they a race or are they a religion? Are they a nationality? Jews were scattered all over the world, of course, following the destruction of the Second Temple and the Bar Kokhba revolt 150 years later. There were very few Jews actually living in what was known as Palestine. They were all over the world. The majority, of course, lived in 
in Poland and Russia. Uh, Russia had an area called the Pale of Settlement, which is now in modern Ukraine. This was an area where Jews were restricted to living. And for the most part, if you want to picture a Jew of the 19th century, you would think of Fiddler on the Roof and Tevye. That's what they were. They were either small shopkeepers, small tradesmen, tinkers, beggars. They certainly were not part of the intellectual elite, although there were some, of course, that were. And Herzl came from a very upper-class family, and he had been highly educated, so he was one of the higher-class Jewish people in Austria. So Herzl went back to Vienna. He wrote his article for the, the Neue Fried Freie Press, and uh, he came up with this idea of what he considered to be Zionism, the return to the Jewish national homeland, or Zion. This was not a new idea. Every year, following the conclusion of the Passover service, the first night of Passover, the final statement in the book, in Hebrew, the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, which means, in English, next year in Jerusalem. So for over 2,000 years, Jews had a longing, a, a longing, a yearning for a return to Palestine. But it was a yearning based more in a spiritual yearning than a belief that they could ever physically bring it about. Because Jews around the world wanted to be integrated into world society. For the, for the most part, of course, you had the ultra-Orthodox who were happy to live their own you know, religious existence and life, like we have today, of course, in Crown Heights in New York and other areas where you have Jewish enclaves of ultra-Orthodox Jews. But because of the 19th century Enlightenment and the growth of city-states around Europe, um, it was possible, if you were Jewish and you got a good education, you could be assimilated. And most of the Jews of Europe were highly assimilated. No, no more so, by the way, than in Germany. In Germany, there was more assimilation amongst Jewish people than any other country in the world at that time. Uh, America was beginning to get Jewish people. Uh, but then there was another event that took place which also had a bearing on Herzl's decision to change the dynamic of how Jews were to be perceived and what they needed to do to create national rights. And that was the assassination of the Tsar Alexander in Russia. Now, Tsar Alexander II was a very enlightened Tsar. He did several things. First of all, he took most of the Jews out of the Pale of Settlement, where they were restricted, which was like a gigantic ghetto, and he allowed certain numbers of them to move into the major Russian cities, especially those that were highly educated. They needed lawyers, they needed you know, bureaucratic officials to run the different areas where the Jews lived, so they were able to become educated. And also, he ended serfdom in Russia. So he was a very enlightened Russian, and then he was assassinated one day in his carriage. And of course, the man who assassinated him, as it later turned out, was an anarchist. An you know, anarchy was fairly prevalent then as a political force. And so it was the anarchists that assassinated him, but the Jews were blamed for it. And what happened was, is it led to a series of pogroms throughout Russia. Now, a pogrom, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you may have heard of the word, a pogrom is a state-sponsored terrorism, and that's what it was. Small officials, local officials, under the direction, not officially, of the government in Moscow, would sponsor acts of violence against Jews in, in certain areas to kind of keep them down. And this is what happened. So this, along with the Dreyfus uh, situation, um, uh, gave uh, Herzl this kind of aha moment. And so, in 1891, he published a book which became an international bestseller. This book is so important historically that it's still published over a hundred years later. And the title of the book, can we go to the picture of the Judenstaat? The Judenstaat. A mo modern Lösung der Judenfrage a modern solution to the Jewish question. That was the title of the book, okay? We know it today here in America as the Jewish state. I have a copy of the book. It's still published and you can get it actually on Amazon. It's never been out of print. It's relatively inexpensive if you want to buy it. And if you want to understand the origins of Zionism, this book will tell you a great deal about it. 
Now, Herzl was uh, a dreamer, okay? He thought, incorrectly, that the Jews of Europe and the world could just get on a boat and take off for Palestine. But he was certainly made very well aware, very quickly, that that was something that it could not happen overnight. It had to be organized. There was a great deal of money involved to create a political organization. But I want to just direct you to a chapter in the book called The Jewish Question. This is in the book. And this is from Herzl's own pen. This is what he said. Palestine is our ever memorable historic home. The very name of Palestine would attract our people with a force of marvelous potency. If his majesty the Sultan, referring of course to the Sultan of Turkey, uh, Abdul Hamid II was his name. He was a very old man. He'd been on the Turkish throne for many decades. So if his majesty the Sultan were to give us Palestine, we could in return undertake to regulate the whole finances of Turkey. We should there form a portion of a rampart of Europe against Asia, an outpost of civilization as opposed to barbarism. We should, as a neutral state, remain in contact with all Europe, which would have to guarantee our existence. The sanctuaries of Christendom would be safeguarded by assigning to them an extraterritorial status such as as is well known to the law of nations. We should form a guard of honor about these sanctuaries, answering for the fulfillment of this duty with our existence. This guard of honor would be the great symbol of the solution of the Jewish question after 18 centuries of Jewish suffering. So his position was very clear. And this book became an international bestseller. By the way, the President of the United States had a copy, Queen Victoria had a copy, Gladstone had a copy. All the, the powerful and the mighty in political circles and social thinkers were reading the, the Jewish state. But, but Herzl found out very quickly, can we go to Herzl, please? Yeah, it's Herzl. Herzl discovered very quickly that the Sultan of Turkey was not going to hand over Palestine to the Jews. It wasn't going to happen. He was very happy and willing for Jews to emigrate to Palestine. Palestine at that time was an outwater, an outback area, you could, you could call it, of the Syrian, uh, the greatest Syrian uh, entity of the map. And so the Ottoman Empire, which was very prevalent throughout the, what we now know as the Middle East or the Near East, uh, the Ottoman Empire had individual uh, representatives, you could call them local high commissioner type officials, who would govern different entities in the Middle East. But Palestine was different, because Palestine, of course, was the site of the three major religions. You had the, you know, the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem was, as still is, the third most holy shrine of Islam. Behind Mecca, Medina, we've got Jerusalem. And that reason, the, the, because of that, the, the, the Turkish government, or through the Sultan, directly controlled any matters concerning Palestine. So what the Sultan said was, he said to one of Herzl's uh, you know, representatives, even, so he, even, he didn't meet with Herzl, the, the visitor or the Prime Minister of the Ottoman Empire met with Herzl and told him, you want to come here and you want, if you want to live here but along with all our other subjects, you, know, you can be a subject of the Ottoman Empire because we have other people here. We have Muslims, we have Christians, and the Jews were a minority in the Holy Land at that time. That's something that a lot of people are not aware of. Okay. Although there had always been a Jewish presence in Palestine, going back to the time of Judea, when the Romans, of course, finally destroyed the country and then eventually were overthrown, throughout the entire two, two and a half thousand plus years, Jews had always been in Palestine. But the majority of them were either, either ultra-religious or they were Jewish people reaching the end of their life who wanted to spend their last days in the Holy Land. But in terms of their numbers, they were a very small minority of the population. This, of course, went against Herzl's thinking. Can we go to the next slide? 
And so he called a meeting of all the Jewish representatives of the world at that time to the uh, city of Basel in Switzerland, and he convened what we now know as the first Zionist Congress in 1897. Nobody took Herzl seriously at the meeting, and Herzl said in his opening speech, among other things, he's famous for a phrase that, uh, you know, everybody thinks, he said, that we are being so optimistic in our hopes for the future of the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. However, he said, within 50 years you will have the state. And he actually was almost spot on, because 50 years after this was the creation of the state of Israel. But there was the problem of the indigenous population. Let's call them Arabs for the purpose of this discussion, because they would not have considered themselves Arabs. Any, what we would consider today, Palestinian or Arab, living in what was then Palestine at that time, would have considered himself or would have been known as a member of Greater Assyria or Shams, to give it its Arabic name. So Greater Assyria was the overall governing body of the small part of the country of Palestine, or what we know of as Palestine. And so um, Herzl, who realized he was up against um, a bit of a problem here with how was he going to get this to happen, uh, laid out a plan, and the plan was that the only way that this was going to occur, this resettlement, would be to encourage Jews from around the world in the, in the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora, to settle in the land. But that would require a great deal of money, and that wealthy Jewish uh, finances or backers would be able to fund the, those operations and to encourage uh, people to move to Palestine. He didn't have much success early on. And it got to the stage, not long after this first Zionist Congress, we now come to the second Zionist Congress. Can I go to the next picture? Sell okay. Hami, you've heard about him. Next one. That's Hami. That's the Ottoman Empire, by the way. You may want to look at that. Uh, that's from 1699 to 1914. You can see it was primarily at that time in the East. But the Ottoman Empire was known as the sick man of Europe. Because what had been happening for over 200 years was that the empire was gradually shrinking as more and more countries gained their independence and as the Turks couldn't bear the financial responsibility of running those countries, the empire started to shrink. But this is, this is the Ottoman Empire uh, from the end of the 17th century to the uh, beginning of the last century. As you can see, there are many countries in there. You've got the Balkans, Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, parts of Italy. I mean, it was all, it was all very, um, you know, it was huge, but it was shrinking. It was, it was reducing in importance and size. And this, of course, gave opportunity to the British and to the French, because they loved to play what was known as, at that time, as the great game. How can we benefit our own interests by taking away the power of other empires? And the Ottoman Empire was a fair game for most of the major powers. More about that later. So what happened was, as a result of this, uh, uh, I would say, uh, inability of Herzl to convince the Ottoman Sultan, he also had a meeting, by the way, with the Kaiser in Germany. That also didn't prove very fruitful. Herzl came up with an idea that he thought would be a perfect solution to the problem. Can I go to the next slide, please? Okay, we'll get to him in a moment. Just look at him for now. He came up with a perfect solution to the problem, and what was his solution? Well, something that became known as the Uganda question. Have any of you heard of that, the Uganda question? No? What was the Uganda question? Uganda was not an independent country as we know it today. It was part of the empire of Great Britain. So Britain controlled most of Africa. You had other areas, you know, that were controlled by the Belgians, Germany, had little small enclaves in Africa. But the large majority of Africa formed part of the British Empire. And there was this area, which we now know as Uganda, which was very fertile. Okay, you had water supplies, you had a bit of infrastructure. And so Herzl thought, well, you know, if I can't get the Jews and I can't create my Zionist dream in Palestine, maybe another country could be an option. So he met with the British Foreign Secretary, and the British Foreign Secretary said to Herzl, okay, um, what about Uganda? And 
sure enough, at the second Zionist Congress, which was four years after the first, Herzl stood on the platform. And I want to now read a quote from a person called Salome Levitt. Now, Salome Levitt was a delegate to that Congress. She was originally from Greece, and Salome Levitt describes what happened. So picture this, Herzl comes out, he's about to make his address, and there's a sense of tension in the air, because people knew that it was going to be a momentous announcement, but they weren't sure of what it was going to be. So this is how she uh, describes it. There were greetings and opening speeches, just as always. The tension was enormous. We felt that there was always something extraordinary in the air. Suddenly Herzl rose and declared, I have a great surprise for you, fellow delegates. His Majesty, Sovereign of the British Empire, that was King Edward VII, by the way, is sending you a gift, a gift called Uganda. When he returned to his seat, she writes, there was unbelievable tension in the room, but total silence. Not a single voice was heard. Then, suddenly, it was as if the entire hall had stirred to life. Some people began shouting, we don't want it, we don't want it. While others screamed, yes we do, yes we do. It was like a great scandal. Now, where do I get that quote from? I get that quote from a book called Pillar of Fire by an author called Yigal Lossin. You can find this, by the way, and I'm, I'm happy at the end of the presentation to show you the book. You can find this, by the way, uh, on Amazon. And this was a BBC documentary series that was made in the 1970s, 1971, actually, when Salome Levitt and many others were still alive who were interviewed. I have the whole set of DVDs at home. It's fascinating because it's, it's all kinds of eminent people, British diplomats, Arabs, I mean, everybody's on there. And so, Herzl failed in his Uganda question proposition, and sure, sure enough, a year later, he's deposed as the head of the World Zionist Congress, and in his, uh, in his place was a young chemist, okay, from Germany, who was actually living in England at the time. He was a research chemist at the University of Manchester, became the new head of the World Zionist Congress, and his name was Chaim Weizmann. More about him later. So Weizmann takes over from Herzl, and he's now representing this Zionist uh, proposition. Now what about the Arabs? Now we get to the nitty gritty of it, and this is controversial, but it is historical fact. What about the Arabs? Who were the Arabs? I've already told you that the idea of Arab nationalism did not really exist. But Arabs formed part of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East, and they considered themselves loyal citizens of the Turks. And that remained the case until the beginning of the last century, when we had a, there was a revolution in Turkey that toppled the Sultan and a group of young intellectuals and Turkish officers uh, took over the running of the country, and they, they, we now know them as the Young Turks. So this Young Turkish Revolution spurred, brought on changes within the Ottoman Empire. And so for the first time, the indigenous population of Palestine, and we'll call them Arabs, the indigenous population of Palestine saw this nationalistic uh, beginning uh, that had happened in Turkey, the toppling of the Sultan, I mean it was huge, it would be like you know King Charles being overthrown, nobody could imagine that today, or the Queen in the past, and so uh, they harbored these same ideas. The problem that the Arabs had is that the Zionists, and that's those people who wanted the return to Palestine, the land of Israel, the land of Zion, Okay, the Zionist, the Zionist enterprise or organization wanted its people, its Jewish uh, members around the world, including those who were not part of the organization, to believe that Palestine was a desolate land. And it coined a phrase, a land for a people, sorry, a land without people for a people without land. That became a phrase, a land without people for a people without land. 
But it was a hard sell. How do we sell this? And so what happened is that the Zionist organization, along with money which had been given to it by Lord Rothschild in England from the English branch of the family, sponsored and paid for a documentary film to be made in 1904. This documentary film, and the, you can imagine the cameras that they had to, you know, to schlep across over to Palestine, was to try to present this image of a barren land. And it was a Russian filmmaker called Sokolovsky who made the film. And the film was actually lost until 1989. Nobody knew where it was, they knew of it. And it turned up in a, in a shed somewhere in Switzerland. And you can see this actually today uh, on YouTube. You can actually search it, you can find it. And uh, I highly recommend you, by the way, to go to a book. Sorry, this is a good book, but if you go to YouTube and you type in Jerusalem 1913, Amy Docker Marcus, you will see, as part of a one-hour documentary, large sections from that film. But what you can notice if you see the film is that you see, you know, Jewish immigrants arriving into the port of Haifa, you know, the farms in Israel, and everything is wonderful. And it's presented as a barren landscape that's going to be fruitful, like in the biblical land of milk and honey. But in the background of the film, which wasn't part, by the way, of the cameraman's scope, there were Arab villages, Arab towns, Arab Bedouin farmers. None of that was made part of the film. So you could call it, in a way, a, a propaganda documentary. But it was very, very successful. And so this Arab nationalism, This Arab nationalism, and I think now we can go to, uh, now we, can we go to the next one, to another picture? No, go, I'm sorry, let's go back again, I apologise. I'm a bit confused, excuse me, with my pictures, I apologise. This Arab nationalism focused on the fact that land, large portions of what, was, what we now know as the land of Palestine or the land of Israel, which had been lived on by Arabs for 400 years, Many of them were, were tenant farmers. They weren't necessarily landowners, although a large number of them were, but there were also others who had nevertheless lived there for generations, you know, farming, you know, growing olives and, you know, whatever, dates, things for export, okay? Large sectors of that land was owned by wealthy Arab landowners in other parts of the Turkish Empire, primarily in Egypt and in Lebanon, or Beirut which is now, of course, in Lebanon. And uh, this was brought to the notice of a man by the name of Ali Carmiel, who in 1913 uh, created what became known as the Arab-Palestine League. And Ali Carmiel wrote, in relation to this land issue, what have we, the Arabs, to do with the Beirutis, meaning the people in Beirut? Our economic and social situation does not resemble theirs. We are in a bad predicament. We should establish a league to defend the Palestinian homeland, not only from the young Turks in Istanbul, but also from Zionism. And what happened as a result of that, a secret organization came out of this Arab League that was mentioned in this article in the newspaper, that, was, that we now know as Al Fatah. And Al Fatah was created as a direct response to the fact that the Arabs rightfully felt, in their opinion, that they were being excluded from the conversation, this conversation of nationhood, while all of the other countries around the world are now you know, pushing themselves forward as national identities. We, the Arabs, have been left behind. So. What did they uh, want? Well, they wanted to save Jews by gathering them in Palestine under Palestinian control. In other words, what they said was, which was felt by a large number of them, we're not anti-Jewish, we're just anti this new Zionist enterprise. We want all the Jews who want to come to Palestine, let them come, but let them be under a general umbrella, just like in the United States. You know, people came here from all over the world. They didn't try to form a new country. They weren't trying to create a new Russia or a new Hungary or a new 
Yugoslavia, they wanted to be part of this general nation state. Um, so, he also went on to say, the Arab is noble and large-hearted. He is also, however, vengeful and never forgets an ill deed. If England and other countries around the world do not take up the cause of the Arabs, other powers will. It is not only the Muslims of Palestine to whom Great Britain and Turkey will have to listen to. From India, Mesopotamia, that's by the way modern day Iraq, the Hejaz and Palestine, the cry goes up to the world. If she does not listen then, perhaps Russia will take up the call on another day. We've brought in this idea of, you know, Russia's always there, Russia can step in and help us if necessary. The voice of Russia also is not heard in the councils of the nations. And so, the time must come when our voice, and maybe even the Russians' voice, will also be heard. And so this was the beginning of Arab nationalism. Now, everything changes, of course. The Great War, or as we now know, the First World War breaks out in August 1914. A war, by the way, which was meant to be over by Christmas. They always say that, you know, be over in a couple of weeks. And of course, it wasn't over by Christmas. And so by the year 1917, I'll jump forward a little, little bit because I'm running out of time. By the year 1917, the British have had nothing but a series of losses. No success. The only thing I can think of in your lifetimes that comes close to it would be the situation with the Second World War, where it took the great victory of El Alamein and the retreat from Dunkirk, as Churchill called it, we turned defeat into victory and the victory over you know, Ronald and Al Alamein that turned you know, the tide of battle and, and an awful situation. And this was a time of the stalemate of the First World War, of what became known as the Trench War. So by 1917, the British, okay, and their allies, uh, along with the Germans and their allies, were facing each other in trenches with a no-man's land in between and basically a stalemate situation. You know, they would get up, they would march a few feet, you know, they might gain a hundred yards, and then they might lose 10 or 15,000 soldiers. The Germans would try the same thing, and then they would retreat back to their trenches. Nothing was happening. The culmination, and we bring in this particular man now, the culmination which changed everything was a battle in France at a small town called Arras. Now, Arras was on a line of trenches. It was the bottom part of the line of trenches that stretched from Belgium to France. And there was a battle in this town called Arras where the British decided, along with the Germans, to break, that they were going to break the trench stalemates. And so, following a four-day bombardment of heavy artillery, the British and the French, sorry, the British and the Germans got up out of their trenches on either side and tried to gain ground on the other side. Over a four-day battle, the Germans lost 150,000 troops, and the British and their allies lost 100,000 men. It was a national disaster. It was the largest single loss of life, by the way, in the history of the British Army up until that time. I don't know about the German Imperial Army, but it certainly wasn't fun for them either. The commander of the British Army in Arras was this man here. Sir Edmund Allenby. Sir Edmund Allenby, or the Bull, as he was known as, the Bull, Bull Allenby, rather than fire him, which would have admitted that they'd made a mistake, you know, with the Battle of Arras, they shunted him off. And where did they shunt him off to? <laughs> the Middle East. So where did he go? He was sent to Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, where they also suffered a humiliating defeat, the British Army, against the Turks, in another battle called the Battle of Kut, or Kut, K-U-T. And that, that battle, for the first time, actually since the, uh, the defeat of the British Army in Isandwana in South Africa against the Zulus, which led to Rourke's Rift, that's a whole other story. Uh, it was the largest defeat since the 1870s uh, in that region, or anywhere close to it. So, Alan goes to Mesopotamia, and once he's there, he decides that he is going to make a trip 
from Mesopotamia and conquer land all the way to Jerusalem. And that's what he did. Can we go to the next slide? Now this is a photograph taken, it says on the top in Hebrew, Pesach, which means Passover, on the right side, the Jewish language is written from right to left, the right side of the photograph, Pesach, Yerushalayim, which means Jerusalem, and then the date, 1918. So this is shortly after the fall of the city of Jerusalem. If you look in the front row, there's an arrow pointing to a young 18-year-old private in that group of British soldiers. This, by the way, is the 17th Royal Fusiliers, which was a regiment that that young man belonged to. That is my grandfather. He was actually part of the British Army under Allenby, who liberated the city of Jerusalem. Before he left, right, uh, his name was Moss, and his last name was Simmons, that's my mother's maiden name. Before he left, my great-grandmother went to Harrods in London and purchased a watch for him that he could carry with him uh, during his travails in Mesopotamia, and hopefully he would make it home, but of course he did make it home. And I'm wearing the watch today. Ah. It still works, it's great, by the way. It's a trench, a trench watch. For that. I, I only bring it out on rare occasions. I thought you might like to see that. Can I go to the next picture? The 11th of December, 1970. The victorious Allenby dismounts and enters Jerusalem out of respect for the Holy City. Now, by the 18th century in Great Britain, there was a rule that was enforced throughout the British Army, and that was that no soldier or officer was allowed to ride a white horse. Now, white horses traditionally had been for the use of officers. Why? Because white horses tended to be, for the most part, Arabian stock horses, and they were the best horses. So in an age before mechanised transport, only the officers rode white horses. But they became targets. And so if you were in a, in a, in a, in a you know, wartime situation, the last thing you'd want would be for your man to be on a white horse. But Allenby rode a white horse to the gates of Jerusalem, to the Jaffa Gate, which you can see in the background. You see that little, uh, looks like a fortress? That's the gate he came through. It's called the Jaffa Gate. You can still enter that into the old city of Jerusalem. As he approached the gates of the city of Jerusalem after a three-month campaign, along with my grandfather, who was part of that detachment, he got off his horse and he walked, you know, followed by his troops, through the city. He dismounted. And he was asked by a reporter, General, why did you do that? And he said, because I entered Jerusalem as a liberator, not a conqueror. That's what he said, I'm entering as a liberator, not a conqueror. The Arabs, on the other hand, living in Jerusalem, they also thought that this was going to be a good moment for them because, after all, you know, the great British Empire was certainly going to be more benign than the despotic Turkish Empire and that this would be uh, a sign of good times to come. But very quickly it deteriorated because what happened was that it encouraged the Zionists in Palestine that those who were Jewish who had moved there, by this time there were more of them, there were actually quite a large number. It encouraged them to speed up their fundraising campaign, to purchase land, okay, in the, in the uh, coastal areas and the central part of Palestine, to purchase land and to, um, to uh, you know, to just get the movement moving along. One of the things they did, by the way, is they created the Jewish National Fund, which is still in existence. And so these little boxes, which if you go to any synagogue or Jewish house, you will still see these. This Jewish National Fund box was created in 1901 for the purchase of raising money around the world to buy land and to grow trees in the land of Palestine. And so that's just a, a modern version. I don't have the original one. It would be worth a lot of money if I did. And so, um, Before we come to the Herzl, to the, to the Balfour Declaration, I've only got, have I got another five minutes afterwards, is that okay? Before we come to the Balfour de Declaration, okay, 
Um, what did the people in the United Kingdom think about this situation with the Jews and the Arabs in Palestine? Now the British are controlling the country in Palestine. Well, it was mixed because there were Jews who were against Zionism in Palestine. That's kind of hard to believe today. Why? Because they saw it as a kind of anti-Semitism. If you can imagine that you were a Jewish person who had spent in England, forget America now, America was a whole different situation compared to the rest of Europe. But if you had spent as a Jew in England and you and your family 300 years trying to become amalgamated into a society and to be considered English or British, this idea that somehow you had another allegiance or another loyalty to another country was very problematic for many Jewish people living in England, particularly amongst the aristocracy and the, the uh, highly educated Jewish class in the country. So let's move on to the next picture. The British, in the meantime, uh, decided that they would, because uh, they needed to, they, that they would, in order to further prosecute the war, which was still going on in Europe, by the way, that they would have to find a way to finally smash the, the uh, uh, Turkish Empire, or the Ottoman Empire. And so before Allen even entered Jerusalem, they entered, the British government and the foreign, the foreign secretary of that government entered into secret negotiations with the uh, King Hussein of Mecca. The King Hussein of Mecca. Now, although King Hussein of Mecca was not a, a, internationally accepted as a king, he was a prince. And he was recognized by his people as the, king, as the king of Mecca. He was also, by the way, a direct descendant, uh, according to tradition, of the prophet Muhammad. He came from the Hashemite family, which could trace its way all the way back to the 8th century, to the prophet Muhammad. And so King Hussein of Mecca, the king of Hejaz, king of the Arabs, the Sharifian Caliph, which meant the prince in charge of the holy uh, sites uh, in, in Palestine and so on, uh, he met uh, with the next man, I think I've got him, ah. Lieutenant Colonel Sir Henry McMahon. Now, Lieutenant Colonel Sir Henry McMahon was the High Commissioner in Egypt, the British High Commissioner in Egypt. And they wanted allies, the British needed allies to fight the Turks. And they thought, if we can get the local Arabs to rise up against the Turks, we can make a promise to them, if you help us defeat the Turks, then you will have your own country. When we eventually end this war, we will give you statehood, nationhood. And so after uh, uh, McMahon met with uh, Hussein of Mecca, three letters were sent from McMahon outlining a agreement, not a treaty, it hadn't been ratified by Parliament, an agreement between the British government and the king of the Hejaz, Sharif Hussein, which led to what we now know as the Arab revolt against the Turks. So the Arab army, so to speak, they, were, they rose up and they were funded by the British and they were led by, of course, a very charismatic young officer under the control of Allenby. Let's move to the next picture. <laughs> Lieutenant Lawrence. T.E. Lawrence, or as we now know him, Lawrence of Arabia. And that's him as a young officer. Can we go to the next picture? And that's him in his splendid Arab dress. Lawrence had been working as an archaeologist, what we now know as Jordan, mapping, because he was, a, he was very smart, a brilliant academic, his speciality was archaeology, mapping uh, crusader sites in modern Jordan and in Syria, in the Middle East. And he had been secretly sending back information to the British. And what he discovered as a regular civilian while he was in these areas, undercover so to speak, was that the best way to defeat the Turks would be to, to break down their supplies of communication. And that meant destroying the railway that ran from Damascus in the north, in Syria, all the way down to uh, modern day Palestine. It was called the Hejaz Railway Line. And so Lawrence, along with his irregular troops, started to blow up these uh, places. The war, of course, ends. The Turks are defeated. Peace comes in 1918. And just before then, when the Arabs thought 
that they would be given their statehood, along comes what we now know as another document which changed everything. By the way, they completely denied that they'd ever signed these letters with the king. There were three of them, by the way. They'd all been signed. On November the 2nd, 1917, the 2nd of November, 1917, comes what I believe to be the beginning of the Arab-Israeli conflict. This is what started everything. Up until then, it had been a very tricky situation. The, the, the relations between Arabs and Jews were strained, but it reached a breaking point in 1917 when this following letter was sent to Dr. Weizmann, the head of the Zionist organization in London. Now, Weizmann had made a name for himself during the Great War by chemically creating cordite, which was used in the creation of munitions. The great benefit of cordite, which was like a form of gunpowder, was that it, it, first of all, it prevented barrels from overheating when bullets were fired repeatedly in guns or in artillery pieces, but also it reduced the amount of smoke that came out of the barrels, which of course made you less visible to the enemy. They couldn't see you if there wasn't as much smoke. So he artificially created in a lab in Manchester a method of producing cordite, and the Germans, by the way, had a control of that. So this is the, this letter that was sent to, uh, to Lord Rothschild, by the way. Dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you, on behalf of His Majesty's Government, the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved to by the Cabinet. His Majesty's Government, now this is a statement, his Majesty's Government views with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, and we will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you could bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. 37 words long, the letter, that changed everything. Because it's so ambiguous. It talks about a homeland for the Jewish people, providing, there's always a but, providing the rights of the other indigenous peoples, or peoples living in the area, are not affected. Well, who were the other peoples? Was it the Christians? Was it the Arabs? What did it really mean? It didn't really mean anything. And it came to a head, actually, because this declaration was made without taking into account anything to do with the national aspirations of the Arab population of Palestine, which was still the majority of people in that country at that time. So, yes, they were mistreated, there's no doubt about it, but the British did that throughout their entire history. You know, they would make promises that they knew they couldn't keep, and when they broke the promises, they were denied that they made the promises in the first place. And so, um, I've got another five minutes. And so, I want to mention a comment that was made at the time. I can go on forever. You enjoy it. Yes. I want to mention a comment that was made at the time by the Secretary of State for War, Winston Churchill, okay, who had just been appointed to the new government of David Lloyd George. David Lloyd George, by the way, was at the time uh, the, the Liberal Prime Minister of Great Britain. Actually, it was the last Liberal Prime Minister that Great Britain ever had. The Liberal Party today is a very small party, but he was the last Liberal Prime Minister. Churchill uh, said the following. It is manifestly right, he said, that the Jews who are scattered all over the world have a national centre and a national home where some of them may be reunited if they want to. And where else could that be but on this land of Palestine, which for more than 3,000 years they have been ultimately and profoundly associated with, we think in the government, okay, will be a good thing for the entire world, good for the Jews and good for Palestine. I would, uh, I would draw your attention, he said, to the second part of the Balfour Declaration, 
which solemnly and explicitly promises to the inhabitants of Palestine the fullest protection of their civil and political rights. Yes, maybe it did, but it certainly didn't promise anything as far as national aspiration to the other people within the country, the Palestinian Arabs, who should have at least been consulted. You know, there wasn't just one party, there was more than one party. Um, can I go to the next? Let's move on, can we? There's a photograph of Mohammed Hashanin al Husseini. He was the Mufti, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, the leading Arab cleric in the city of Jerusalem, the guardian of the Al Aqsa Mosque for the purposes of Jerusalem. He, he was opposed. Let's move on forward again. Sir Arthur Balfour. He was a man who had written the Declaration. Sir Arthur Balfour. Let's go on again. And finally, I want to mention this man, Khalil al Sakakini. I've unfortunately run out of time. I, maybe I could do a second part of this on another occasion. Where I could go into that. What do you think? So, Khalil al Sakakini was a Palestinian nationalist, the man who today has lost the history, unless you are a fanatic about this period of events. He was an Arab Christian. Of course, there are Arabs who are Christians living in Jerusalem. He was a news editor. He was also an educator, a highly intelligent intellectual man. And uh, he lived from 1878 to 1953. So he had a very long life. Okay. And on January the 23rd, 1918, not long after the Balfour Declaration, he wrote the following in his diary. On this day, I was born and named after my brother, who had died in childhood. I am not a Christian, nor a Buddhist. Neither am I a Muslim, nor a Jew. Just as I am not Arab, or English, nor French, nor German, nor Turkish. I am just another member of the human race. He then went on to say, The Arabs, referring to himself, are a miserable nation, our interest is to be a single people, to be educated in a single culture and to a single way and to hope, a single hope. We have a place, we have a language, and we have a culture. And he went on finally to say, these are things that the current British government failed to recognize. Independence, independence, that's how his diary ended. Uh, he said at one moment, another meeting, and I'm going to end on this. He said, these are the most important times in the, in the, in the uh, chronicle of this country. It is incumbent upon us, he said, to cultivate the nationalist sentiment, sentiment amongst Arabs. Perhaps it will live again after its days have nearly reached their end. We must invigorate the nation's youth, breathe hope into it. We must make ourselves heard everywhere, in the homes and on the streets, in all the clubs and in all of the congresses. A bit Churchillian, that, isn't it? Our national aspiration must become part of every conversation. We must capture the world's attention. In short, we must show signs of life. That's how important it was to him that the Arab population in Palestine showed life. I have almost, he said, become the leader of a national movement. You know, he was almost standing for election. And so in 1919, and this is the end, in 1919 at the Zohar Cinema in Jaffa, in modern day Israel, which is now preserved as a national monument by the Israeli government because it is an important site, the Muslim Christian Association was founded to promote Arab nationalism and the idea of an Arab entity, not just a Jewish entity, in Palestine. Now, I haven't been able to go on with what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, I overran my time. But I would like, hopefully, to come back again and we can continue the discussion. Thank you very much.